Coming up on Tech News Today, Zynga gets friendly. But are they just imitating The Sims being friendly with you? Also, what Google will announce tomorrow at Google I.O. And Orbitz gouges Apple users. Or do they? All that more coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, June 26th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to Squarespace.com and use offer code TNT6. And they now offer free domain registration with annual plan subscriptions. And by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker who needs stock video clips, photos, illustrations, music tracks, or sound effects, check out Pond5 for instant downloads at the best prices anywhere. Check out Pond5 at Pond5.com. And for 25% off this month, use code TWIT25. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Aya Zaktar. I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show that gives you all the tech news you need each day. We count down the top 10 stories of the day to start in the news views. Zynga held their second annual Zynga Unleashed event in San Francisco and unveiled a unified platform called Zynga with Friends, allowing players to chat and play games across web, Android, iOS, Facebook, and Google Plus instances of Zynga games. Zynga Partners for Mobile features a new API that it intends to bring in third-party developers onto the Zynga platform. And three new Vils are coming, including a Sims social clone called The Vil, a restaurant-themed Chef Vil, and Farmville 2. What's different about Farmville 2? It's in 3D. Not 3D Ville. Mac users, you're part of a special club thanks to Orbitz. The Wall Street Journal reports that Orbitz is experimenting on its site, showing Mac users more expensive results first because the site found Mac users typically spend up to 30% more per night on hotels. The CEO of Orbitz, Barney Harford, said the site is merely reflecting the preferences of the users. But before everyone freaks out... Orbits allows for sortability, so you can still see the lowest cost stuff up front. And in progression towards Skynet news, a Google neural network researched in the Google X laboratory has taught itself what a cat looks like after viewing 10 million thumbnail images from YouTube videos. Insert your own YouTube cat video joke here. The network is twice as capable as previous efforts at recognizing objects from a list of 20,000 distinct items and providing advances in understudying, not understanding, sorry, not only AI, but also how our neurons work. The neural network is powered by 16,000 computer processors. Congratulations, iOS. It's an app. Apple released its own dedicated app for podcasts, creatively titled Podcasts. The free app allows you to browse, subscribe, sync, and download your podcasts. It's available right now for iPhone and iPad. Brightcove thinks they found the new Apple TV, and it's been here all along. The company, which supplies back-end support for online videos, is launching an app cloud platform that will help media companies create dual-screen apps, programs which use the iPhone or iPad as a remote control while streaming HD video to television sets through an Apple TV. Companies are obsessed with providing second-screen value for what we watch on TV, so this is their chance. I want a third screen. CNET reports that the next-generation Kindle Fire will be launched at an event targeted for July 31st. CNET sources say the next Fire would include physical volume controls and a camera. Meanwhile, according to Digitimes, the new Fire could still have a 7-inch display, but with higher resolution compared to the first first generation. The first generation Kindle Fire would still be available for $150. Dell announced two new additions to the XPS laptop line, including a 14-inch that can qualify as an ultrabook if it wants to and a higher end 15.6 inch laptop both new machines have thin aluminum casings edge-to-edge displays with corning's gorilla glass backlit chiclet keyboards and multi-gesture touchpads and they're both available now the xps 14 will sell for 1100 and the xps 15 starts at 1300 bucks vizio introduced a new set-top box called the vizio co-star now this device brings google tv and on live cloud gaming to your television it will cost only about a hundred dollars the co-star comes with a bluetooth remote control but you'll have to purchase your own video game controller separately. Free orders start next month. You know what happens if the firmware gets bricked? No. It's the uh, Vizio coaster. 
Mozilla released a new version of Firefox for Android in the Google Play Store, emphasizing improvements in speed, rendering, load times, and interface, all significantly sped up. Zooming, panning, and launching the browser should all be quicker than before. Mozilla also added built-in syncing options that Mozilla calls the awesome screen. Displaying all of your bookmarks, history, and password data to your Android phone. UK telecom regulator Ofcom published a draft code that could require ISPs to issue copyright infringement reports to, sus to suspected pirates. The ISPs would be required to keep a list of infringements, and after three strikes in one year, copyright holders would have the ability to get a court order to obtain user data for use in illegal action. I suspect you of being a pirate. It's the eye patch. All right, we're going to discuss some of those stories of the day with Rich Demuro in just a second, but I want to thank our sponsor for today's show, Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. was using it this weekend. So easy to update on the go. Keeps your site looking good. It's 24-7 support if you do run into a question or a problem, uh, but you probably won't. It's so easy to use and it's reliable. It keeps your site up no matter how much traffic is going. Uh, and never has there been a better time to try Squarespace than right now. they got some great incentives happening this month, uh, including signing up for a new account, getting you a discount, and free domain registration to all annual plan customers. It's completely integrated within the sign-up process, and you get to keep that domain forever. It's a $15 value just thrown in. When you sign up, you got to check this out. Squarespace also recently reduced its prices. Plans start as low as $8 a month. And Squarespace is still giving you, as a TNT listener, 10% off your first purchase on new accounts. Uh, that means 10% off the first month on monthly plans. Or if you buy a year, you get 10% off your entire first year. But don't take our word for it. You don't even need a credit card. Go try it out. Sign up at Squarespace.com. Just put a name in, start a blog, maybe use the import blog tool to take your current blog in there see how it looks in the squarespace templates we think you're going to like it squarespace.com we thank them for their support of tech news today all right let's welcome rich demuro a tech reporter from ktla to the show today how's it going rich hey guys going great how are you guys doing we're doing Good. very well thanks for joining us man thanks for having me it's always always fun to be on tech news today it seems sunny down there in la it is uh, eternally sunny here in Los Angeles. <laughs> that must well, be nice. Let's start with this Zynga Unleashed announcement, all the vills and all the APIs and cross-platform. It seems like what Zynga is going for here is to be the first to really crack this cross-platform gaming system that everybody's trying. Probably Steam is the best example of this so far, but Steam is only on PCs. Uh, and what people are trying to do in the more casual market is say, if you start playing a game on your phone, you should be able to continue to play that game on Facebook or on your tablet. And you should be able to chat with your friends across all platforms, no matter where they're playing their games. Have they cracked it? Rich, what do you I, think? I think so. I mean, I think this seems like a no-brainer for the future of their company. I mean, you can't have these siloed games where you, you play a game on Facebook or you play a game on iOS or you play a game, um, you know, on your new OnLive device on your TV. So I think they have to be everywhere. And someone wants to start awards with friends games on their phone on the way to work. And then when they get to work, uh, be able to play that same exact game on the computer at work. So I think they're onto something here. Um, I don't play a lot of these games, so I don't really have a lot of experience with them. But, uh, you know, it's just I love the part of the the, com the press conference where they were talking about or their whole uh, event up there. Where they were talking about how many hands of poker are played every minute and and how many different things and transactions happen, like 64,000 words with friends happen uh, in the last minute. I mean, that's pretty amazing. So there is a lot of stuff going on with far with uh, Zynga and their games. So I think that was the most powerful part of this to me. And by allowing their games to be played by on, on lots of different devices, that kind of f makes them further away from Facebook, which they're so tied to that. They don't necessarily want that for their future because when Facebook IPO'd and didn't do so well, Zynga took a hit because they're so tied together. By doing this kind of thing, they have a better chance of going, okay, look, our I iOS apps are good, our Android apps are great, our Google Plus is great because we can have, we can aggregate this, this number instead of going, how many people are on this platform and that platform? Right. And in this, and in this uh, presentation, you know, just show, Zynga did what it did best. It's like, hey, that's a really good game. Let's copy that with the Vils. Yeah, well, of course. Uh, yeah. But I think, I think it's also a, a tricky territory for them because they want to be as close to Facebook as they can to sort of uh, latch onto them and have all the beauty of that and all the people that come along with that. But at the same time, they have to grow up as a company and they have to uh, continue to evolve as a company and say, hey, you know what? We also have to look at these other platforms as well because they're going to be very serious contenders in the future. You know, Zynga is not the first to implement something that's cross-platform. There have been other game companies out there trying this. Zynga is obviously the biggest 
so they have the best chance of making it work. Uh, and I think part of it is is having the Zynga partners for mobile to bring in more developers so you've got more games to play. But I don't see Zynga doing anything differently here. Is uh, The question is, do they have enough momentum by just being big that they can make this work? I think so. I mean, they have the users. So it's it, the users are really going to dictate what they like and what they want to do. So if the users don't take to this, if they don't start chatting with each other, if they don't start using the cross-platform uh, kind of tricks that they're building into this network, uh, then it's not going to work. But I don't see why it wouldn't. I mean, it seems like the people are there. So I think Zynga is also going to let them sort of lead the way. Um, you know, if nobody uses this social lobby... Um, you know, then it's uh, it's like a hotel that nobody's at. You know, you yeah, get down yeah. to the bar. There's like one person sitting there, sadly. Well, and the stock uh, market is not responding the way Zynga would like to this news yet either. Do they ever? Well, that's <laughs> they're just they're just fuddy duddies. I know, but Zynga, as far as I know, they're still below their IPO price. I feel like nobody really understands what Zynga has, and uh, maybe me included. I mean, it seems like they've, they've got a lot of people playing these games, but the fact is they need to monetize this, and they need to be more than just a one-trick wonder. They need to continually uh, make this company something that can survive uh, all these other companies that can do similar things in the future with open APIs. Like, like Rich was saying, like, I mean, Zynga does have – their games are different than other ones because they kind of – coax your friends into playing along because you wouldn't want part of your farm to die and you wouldn't want your friend to be annoyed and because of this the social pressure to play a game these games are played even by people who don't necessarily want to continue playing they're like oh it's showing up right. i'm gonna i see this little notification i'm gonna keep playing it's a different kind of addiction versus playing you know, oh this game's really fun by myself but you know telling your friend hey could you please farm that because i'm, I'm having an issue yes. here uh that, so true that's i think right now why the stock market isn't responding is because there's sing is still taking that hit from buying OMG Pop. They're like, they bought this yeah. thing for a ton of money. It's not doing as well as they would like it to be at this point. And this move for Zynga is probably going to help them in the long term. And maybe the stock market will reflect that. Yeah, this is more of a, this is definitely a long term move. It's showing what they're, what the future holds for this company. But I mean, we saw what happened with Draw Something. I mean, everyone was playing that. Every single person at my work every day was playing that game for a solid couple of weeks. And all of a sudden, I don't hear anything about it. I don't hear that little sound anymore. You know, that, that little uh, Draw Something sound when it refreshes and someone's playing it their turn. Uh, and, you know, they have a game show coming out. So I think Zynga has a lot of uh, synergies with other media too uh, in the future as well. I think they're going to look more into that because, you know, they have this the Draw Something video game or a game show that's going to come out of course it's going to be six months too late yeah but um but you know i think there's various synergies they can work out here but they're gonna uh, have to come up with something that's a new and a hit of their own rather than buying something when it's past its prime or ripping off ea uh that they, they've got to come up with some new ideas I, th I think that's what the stock market is looking at is we're still not seeing anything here that you're doing that nobody else hasn't tried before. Right. What's what's the next breakout hit that you've created that your team has come up with to show that you're still creative, you're still there, and you're still relevant? Google I.O. starts tomorrow morning uh, with its 15 hours of keynotes. Actually, it's just uh, there's a two-hour keynote at 9.30 tomorrow morning Pacific uh, and then another one the next day at 10 a.m. Uh, usually, they break it up roughly between Android and Chrome. We don't know exactly what to expect. We figure something like that's going to happen. Uh, but everybody's putting their bets down today on what we will hear. Now, Google spokesperson has confirmed three things. We're going to hear about Android. We're going to hear about Google Maps for iOS. And we're going to hear about Google Drive. Google Drive is probably the one I've heard the least about, but there is a rumor out there saying that Google's going to create a cloud services platform more generally mm -hmm. that will compete with Amazon's EC2. So a, a high level cloud service, not just a little Google Docs storage area. Not just for consumers. Yeah, yeah. Something a little more enterprisey. So keep your eyes out for that. I think Google Maps for iOS is a lock. Uh, in fact, uh, Jeff Huber, Google's head of commerce, said we look forward to providing amazing Google Maps experiences on iOS in reaction to uh, Apple coming out with their own map app. So that's going to happen. I'm worried about that, though. Can they provide a decent experience on iOS? They can. Well, I think they can. In fact, I think they can provide a much better experience than the app that's there now. But the well, trick yeah. for me is uh, I'm going to have to launch that app Every time I want to use it, exactly. there'll be no more clicking from exactly. within a, a, a default iOS app and launching it because that those links aren't programmable. Right. And I think that's the big issue they run up against. It's the same thing as like Gmail. I mean, maybe you want to use the Gmail app on your phone, 
uh, on your iPhone, but you really can't because, I mean, they did add the notifications, which is nice. But, you know, you click those links and if you want to send an email, the default link goes right to their own program. So I think that's kind of the killer thing here for for Google. And I, I have no doubt that they can make an amazing program. I mean, even Google Maps in their, uh, you know, in the HTML5 and the browser looks amazing. But I think that coming up with this app that you're going to use day to day, it's going to be tough when it does the same thing as what Apple's offering, the turn by turn navigation, whatever they're going to do. And, you know, it's just one extra extra click, one extra opening of the app before you can use that. So I'll be curious to see what they do. I mean, I hope they do something great with that because they need to. I mean, I know for myself, I use Gmail over uh, Apple's built-in mail application because I just find it to be, it's a better experience visually for me when it comes to an iPad because you can have this two-pane uh, interface uh, when it's portrait. But like you guys are saying, when it comes to the default application, the question is when you click that, are you going to copy the link and then paste it right. over? I mean, I, I've and done that with the GPS to, uh, apps right now, but when right. iOS 6 comes out, I don't know how often I'll be using that either. And we've seen the workarounds where, you know, if you copy and pay or you copy a link in one app and all of a sudden you open another, it says, oh, did you want to start using this link inside this app? So there's different little tricks around it. But the, the bottom line is that Apple does not make it easy for these developers to really get in there and, and make alternatives. I mean, even with browsers, I mean, you can't you can use other browsers there, but they're all based on, you know, the same browser that Safari is or the same WebKit. And, um, you know, opening links in those browsers are tough, too. So. Uh, you know, that's one thing I don't like about iOS, that, that closed minded system where, you know, someone like like Google can say, hey, you know what, we're going to do our best. We're going to make this great app for this. But it's going to be really tough on the end users because it doesn't really work the way it should. We're going to hear about the next version of Android. Going to be called Jelly Bean. They just put the sculpture up on the lawn. Uh, there, the picture that was on The Verge earlier today showed the jelly bean spilling out of the jar. Apparently that's because they were still building it. It ended up being a little Android bug, right? Yes, if you keep scrolling down, you'll see it. But the thing is, a lot of people were interpreting the spilled beans because so many details have been leaked out. And you've the beans it. represent there's, the fragmentation. Well, it's simply it's simply the the case was a, the body yeah, of the android. There's a cap on top, and it's just an android. With Those the are individual beans. beans though. Yes, because there's lots of individual that features. Extra. <laughs> clearly, uh, but uh, and it, you don't get all of them all at once. There's there's a lot of when they spill, they spill everywhere. Cause it's just <laughs> fragmented all over the place. Um, uh, Nexus tablet is the thing that we're, everybody's also expecting to hear, whether it's called Nexus tablet or not, but a Google reference tablet of some sort. What do, Round the horn, what do you guys think? Uh, let's start with you all about Android Host. What do you think we're going to hear from Google regarding a tablet tomorrow? My gut tells me a lot of what we talked about yesterday is probably true. Um, and just kind of poking around, and there's there's been a lot of kind of repeat uh, pieces of information that have been leaking out over the past couple of weeks about what the Nexus 7 would be. I don't know if it's going to be called the Nexus 7, uh, although I I don't quite mind that name as a as a name for the tablet. But um, but yeah, that's that's kind of what my guess is is a lot of what we're talking about on yesterday's show, and I would be very happy to see that be the truth. That was a seven inch tablet, hundred ninety nine dollars, decent specs, nothing yeah. groundbreaking. Rich, what do you think? Uh, I think this would be a killer move by Google. One of the most common questions I get from every single viewer, you know, I'm on a lot of morning shows across the nation, and the most common question by far is, can I get a $200 Android tablet? I don't want to pay $500 for the iPad. I want to run Android apps. And uh, the Kindle Fire is pretty lim limiting to what they offer. And all these other little um, Android tablets out there, the, the Colby ones and all that, they're just not very good. Um, so I think if they come out with a solid Google Nexus tablet. This is this thing's going to sell like hotcakes. And if it has a camera on the front, the back, uh, the battery life, uh, I think it's a, a real winner for them. So I hope they do it. Yeah, I think we're definitely getting a, a Google branded tablet tomorrow. It's going to be you know, seven inch. The specs, I think, I, it sounds about right, and the the timing is right because pricing wise, the Tegra three is out already, and the two hundred dollar price point with the limited functionality people are talking about, no cellular data. It, it seems like it's about right, especially since Google has the operating system already set. It's not honeycomb or gingerbread with a skin. This is ice cream sandwich, which is tablet ready, and they need a device. And as we've seen with the Google Play Store, they have that devices tab. It's like, wait, devices plural? You only have one device. Why not come out with a tablet of your own? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Also, uh, Android at Home was announced last year at Google I.O. It's their home automation system based on Android. It was announced as a developer's platform. It was very early days. We haven't seen anything come out to the market from it, but that's not surprising based on where it was last year. The rumor is we're going to hear about a Google product, again, a Google-branded product, that would be similar to the Sonos in that it would stream music throughout the home and possibly video as well. Uh, <sighs> Yeah, can't Rich. They just buy, can't they just, Sonos is one of my favorite products out there. I mean, it, it's, it's so brilliant. When people see it and they see how it works, it's great. So 
uh, I, I'd hate for Google to just kill them. You know, I mean, can't they buy Sonos and, and do it that way? Um, I don't know, but they can definitely do it. I mean, Google wants to get more into entertainment and they've got, they've got this great ecosystem that they're building. It's just a matter of getting it into different places. And they just don't seem to have the ability to do it beautifully or nice or easily, you know, and maybe this is another try at that. I'm just realizing that the devices tab in Google Play could include something ah, at home like that. And, the, and yeah. the thing about Google is they don't need to go out with something like AirPlay or some proprietary thing. There are standards out there like DLNA that, that, that a lot of companies just brand as some kind of thing that Google phones and Android devices should be easily, uh, be, should be easily connected to another device through something as a standard as a DLNA, which would allow you to have other devices outside of Google devices, which is more in Google's you know, wheelhouse. They go, oh, you know what? You can use our device and it'll work with your Samsung device. It'll work with our Nexus. It'll work with our Acer. It doesn't matter because they'll probably be more standards compliant than, I don't know, that fruit company. Yeah, it makes sense that you'd be able to buy a Google TV and, you know, fling a picture or stream video, you know, just like AirPlay to that Google TV. Uh, you know, Microsoft is getting into this. They're trying it with their smart glass. So I think that it makes sense for Google to try this. And, you know, they've done things like you've seen the Chrome to phone and all those different types of things. Like they love the idea of being able to to have all of your stuff everywhere. You know, when you open up your one tab on your Chrome, on your uh, desktop, it's there on your Android phone. So they love the idea of having all of their stuff everywhere. This is definitely a logical extension of that and um you know like you said streaming media to different places the standards are out there and it's just a matter of of making it happen we'll probably hear about project glass don't don't expect to get a product announced date or anything like that but they'll probably show it off uh there's also a rumor that google wallet will get some uh new features possibly moving away from nfc at the same time we're hearing that the iphone is moving towards nfc so that'll be interesting to keep tabs on and google tv we, we, we all remember the troubles with the Bluetooth keyboard on Google TV and their demo at last year's Google I.O. Uh, but Variety had some notes about Google TV poised for a relaunch? A reboot, reboot of sorts. Yeah, I mean, Variety stopped And short. not just mean constantly rebooting because it's fresh. <laughs> Let's no, hope I, not. I think they meant the brand and not necessarily the, the hardware. But Variety stopped short of actually giving details. And right now there's a second set of, of hardware that's, that's out there. With Sony just introduced their uh, new Google television box, which costs $200 Available on July 22nd in the United States. You can uh, pre-order it, I think, yes, starting yesterday. And Google TV's partners, as you know, Eric Schmidt was saying, a lot of TV partners. They have LG, Samsung, and Vizio. And Vizio just introduced their, their co-star. And the co-star has, like I've mentioned in the, in the news views, has on-live integration. Unlike the other Google televisions that have the online viewer, you can actually play games on on the actual co-star. So the, th the thing Although is... Although you have to buy the controller separately. You have to buy separately. the controller separately. Yeah. It's about $99, and that's about the same price as the micro console for OnLive. But at $99, is Google TV more compelling? Because it used to be... I mean, the Sony device is $200, and the review when it came out was like over $200. And I think at $100 with OnLive... Sony device when it came out, I paid... I bought it the first day. It was like $400, I think. Yeah, so was the review. Oh, I mean, wow. and, and it never got better. I mean, that's the thing about that device is it just never, like I had such high hopes for this Google TV. It's from Sony because I said, you know, it's software based. It's so easy. They can upgrade it. They can add a browser that's actually going to work with all these different things, but they just never did. You I know? have to say and the Logitech just, review got better, but not by much. The, the software yeah. definitely did get better. Yeah, I, I yeah, I didn't play with that one as much, but um, I think this on live thing is brilliant. I, and here's the thing: let me just say what I think is the killer feature of the Google TV that no other person, no other um, add-on television viewer, Roku, um, Boxy, none of these things have figured out this little secret that Google TV has that nobody talks about, and that's the fact that they use pass-through video. So you do not have to switch the input on your television. So you can be watching, you know, anything on TV, and all of a sudden you go to your search box that just pulls down right over what you're watching. And I think that's the killer feature of Google TV that not a lot of people realize. It's a small thing, but you know, you guys know when you switch your inputs on your TV to go from Xbox 360 to Apple TV, it takes a couple seconds, the screen flickers, and it's kind of a pain, right? And there's also that barrier to actually using the gadget. So with this CoStar, it does the same thing. It has that pass-through video. I think it's a pretty compelling device for 100 bucks to have the internet on your TV and then also any kind of apps that they might come out with that might actually be compelling as well, which so far I haven't seen any on the Google TV, but maybe they'll come out with them. Who knows? When the review got cut down to $99, I seriously considered it, but with the CoStar mm -hmm. at $100, I mean, that seems really interesting. And on top of what Rich was saying, like that, the pass-through thing was something I was thinking about. I'm like, because I have a smart TV and that thing is slow. 
when I want to bring up Netflix, let's say I'm upgrading. This happens. Uh, I was upgrading my AV receiver, and then I can't get anything through it. So uh, what I can use is my smart television, and then I find out how painfully slow it is. The interface is not meant for anything like what you're used to. But this is right. this is Vizio and Google TV, and Google TV's interface, as you know, Tom, is pretty slick. Yeah, I use the pass through with Direct TV, and the search functionality is great. Now, there's a little bit of a delay on the Logitech Review; it's older hardware, uh, and so it's not as snappy as I would like it to be. It takes a little while for the signal to get down to the repeater and then go to the infrared and across the gap into but it does work uh and so if you've got a newer piece of hardware now i don't know what's inside of the costar the sony has a 1.2 gigahertz marvell chip inside of it so that, that's decent uh, but it should the, both of them should be better hardware than what's in the Logitech review. Now, the, now both these products are coming out in July, which is a, obviously after I/O. What, what is our wish list for Google TV? What are we like? I'm expecting whatever uh, whatever OS that's going to be on these devices will be the upgraded version. What are we hoping? Oh yeah, right. <laughs> I don't know about that. You think you're going to uh, get stuck I, with the old version? I, I don't know. You think Jelly Bean is going to be on these things? I think there'll be a new version of Google TV announced at I/O. Whether oh, yeah, we actually okay, get yeah. it. Anytime soon or not, it's a whole different question. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think the other the other killer thing on this uh, on live that we haven't talked about is the fact that they can add an app that lets you do the full web browsing, just like they do on um, you know their on live desktop app. So, I mean, if they can add that functionality, you could have full web surfing on your TV through Windows. Um, you know, I think that it's it kind of goes against what Google TV is. It's different, like it's kind of like almost a competitor in a way. But uh, you know, if you can have full web browsing through that on-live desktop service on your TV, that'd be kind of neat too. Then you get full access to Hulu and whatever else you can do on a regular computer. So if they added the the on-live Microsoft Office service to get around the ban, that's pretty... That's pretty uh, it's yeah. devious. That's, that's, that's I mean, why, pretty devious. Why can't they? You know, I mean, that's. I think that's the the goal of OnLive is to have an OnLive box. You'll never have to buy a computer again. You just get this little box. You add a keyboard and a mouse and a monitor to it, and next thing you know, you have a uh, a, a whole computer. I just want a Netflix app that doesn't crash every fifth time I use it. <laughs> I, I want Do we lots have any of, app like that. <laughs> <laughs> I want lots of Google TV apps. The th- things that that are, are worthwhile to me. I like. This, I'm going to be the, the dork who likes widgets on his screen. I like to get sports scores. Yeah. I like getting weather tickers and that kind of thing. That's what I want. Like Chumby had a pass-through device like this too. I'm like, I want this to work. That's what I'm yeah. hoping. These small – I want to see a lot of apps being developed for Google TV. I guess that's – And why like haven't it. they? That's what I don't get is this thing when I bought it you know, two years ago or whatever it was. I had such high hopes and what nothing came of it. Okay. What, what I want – I mean everything that I can get on Hulu or on Roku at the very least. I mean Hulu Plus. Hulu uh, Plus HBO is available Go. for Google TV. Oh, it is available? Okay. I, so. I unplugged mine like six months ago. So Okay, maybe it's not. I may be wrong about that. But Netflix is there. HBO Go is there. HBO Go is there. Okay. Well, maybe I have to revisit it. I would like more content deals. I would like to see, you know, ABC have a dedicated app. Basically, what you have on the iPad. Like, I would like those apps. Like, yeah. Or like, basically, if, or if it's on an Android tablet. I want to see it on my television. Yeah. All right, let's take a quick break and thank our other sponsor for today's show, Pond5. Let's say that you're a media maker and you need to create a movie about killer penguins from outer space. Well, where are you going to find stock footage of penguins before the radiation hits them and turns them into killer penguins that leave the planet to invade other planets? Pond 5. That is the place where you can find... Look at, look at all these peng, this penguin footage that's there. That's, that's oh, that is a very insidious-looking penguin You could have a nice dialogue right conversation between these two penguins right here. <laughs> uh, there's also, for those of you on the audio podcast, are like, I cannot see these penguins. There are sound effects on Pond 5 as well for people who make an audio podcast. In fact, we've got uh, some nice penguin sound effects. Right. Supposedly. Yeah, they're applauding yeah. our demise. Oh, yeah? You can hear it right now. That's pretty evil sounding. That's demise speak. They have uh, motion graphics on Pond5. They have vector illustrations, music tracks, all kinds of creative assets, all of which can be downloaded instantly for legal use in virtually any media production. Uh, establishing shots, expensive sky helicopter shots, crane shots, all that stuff at Pond5, affordable and legal for you to use without just going out there on the search engine and digging something up and risking it, go to Pond5. And for artists, Pond5 is, is a great marketplace where you can upload pro-quality content, set your own prices, and receive industry-leading royalties on every sale. If you're a media maker working with video, images, or sound, go right now to Pond5.com. Check it out, P-O-N-D, the number five. And as a member of our audience, you get 25% off your purchase this month when you use the coupon code TWIT25. That's Pond5.com. Use that code TWIT25. We thank Pond5 for their support of Tech News Today. Apple 
uh, secretly, not really secretly, but sort of quietly released a podcast app. This is, we, we'd heard a rumor that this was coming in iOS 6, but it came today. They jumped the gun, and I've been playing with uh, podcasts. That's the app. It's kind of hard to find in the app store. I think, I think your best bet is to simply get a link and then send it to yourself, because looking up podcasts, you're going to get almost anything. Now, I tried out the iPad version, and it's got some interesting details. Let's see. You can see I have a, a, a How Stuff Works podcast here, and there's a, a pane. We'll have the link in the show notes. Yeah, we'll have too. that. I want to like, try to play a, an audio podcast. And there's some really, you know, they've got nice players here. Very cutesy. If we move this graphic up, you can see a tape reel to reel. That I already got one guy on Twitter angry about it. You were kind of kvetching over. I was it more like as well. this seems like a Nintendo kind of <laughs> stuff. It's very cutesy. Of okay, uh, we don't we don't have we have a scrubber down here, and there's a you can make it faster because there's a turtle and a rabbit. You see, you can increase the speed in case you don't know that two X could be faster or not. I'm not really sure why they did that. This it's very very uh, I don't know graphics intensive. I would just go with a totally different look. Tom, what did you think? You tried it on the iPhone. Yeah, it looks great. Uh, I think for discoverability, it's a good thing for podcasts if they can get people to get it and download it, which they, they're they featuring it in the App Store today, so that, that'll help. Uh, it might help get people to use podcasts that haven't used them before. I'm going to subscribe to the same things on it that I subscribe to on Downcast, which is what I use right now for my podcast, and see how it goes. Uh, see if I like it better, if I like it worse, if there's different things about it. Uh, it but I, I do think it's a good thing for podcasters, do you think it's a good thing for consumers of podcast, Rich? Uh, it depends. I haven't played with this yet, so I don't know exactly. Can you actually string the podcast together one after another? Can you make, like I see it says stations, which leads me to believe that you could do that. Like I think the ideal thing for discovery, like you're saying, and, and to be really good for podcasters would be if um, some of these stations were curated where they had like a tech station and they just, you know, had these where you can press play and kind of listen to podcasts just the way you would a radio station. Um, I'm not sure that's what they're doing. They haven't done that in previous implementations. And I know other apps do that. Um it seems like it's just a, a standalone podcast app to me, like what you already have in your iPhone. So I'm not sure what the benefit is of this. I mean, it does resemble just I'm sorry, quicker access. It does resemble a radio. There's like top stations. You can't just hit play and start going. But there's technology. There's all kinds of different. So what happens when you tap stations. on those? They will actually start playing the one that you, you've selected. Okay. And, and then it, they just play all the episodes in, or just the most recent I haven't episode. gotten that far because you don't have a scrubber or anything. I guess yeah. the idea is to listen to a sample. Uh, but the real thing there's is. There's no scrubber? There's no scrubber when you're doing the stations. When you're yeah. in your podcast, you can do the scrubbing. Uh, but the, I guess my question is because I was playing with this and it doesn't kick out podcasts from the music app. That's still in there. You can still access the same podcast. And it auto-populates your subscriptions, too. That's correct. So it's kind of acting as another front end for something you already had function in, in your music app. I mean, right. Rich, what, what do you think this means for music and the iTunes apps in iOS 6? Because that's, that's coming up. Yeah, I think that, it, I mean, they'll, they'll end up probably taking that functionality out if you don't download. Well, maybe not. I and mean, they broke out the Books app, the iBooks. So I think uh, it's... Uh, I think this is what we're going to see. This is a new way to break these podcasts out. It's a new way to to, re, uh, to get interest in these podcasts. I don't know. I really like what Stitcher's doing with podcasts. I really think that that's, to me, an easier way to consume podcasts where it's kind of downloads them. It's a no-brainer. You know, when I, when I press Stitcher on my phone every morning and I listen every single morning on my way to work, I press one button uh, and the podcasts just start playing by themselves. I mean, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to think if I'm listening to the latest one. Uh, it's There's not many things I have to press. And I think that that's the way to go. And maybe, you know, this is obviously the first iteration of this, so maybe that can change. But um, I don't know, maybe Apple doesn't want to be seen as a threat to radio. I don't know. I can't really, uh, they've already killed radio, so I guess they don't really care about that anymore. Um, uh, well, that's uh, the reason I use Downcast is the same thing. I don't have to think about it. I press refresh, gives me the latest ones, press play, and I'm off. So I, I, I like that. I like that as well. That's why I want to try this out. I want to see if it why, why is Apple so scared of that feature though? That's my question. They've they've never really built it into to anything. I mean, it's it's always like sort of a one listen to one episode, con, consume that episode, and then move on. Well, that's easily and, answered, Rich, because you don't want to do that. <laughs> Otherwise, Apple would have put it. In. Yeah, you're listening that's well. True. That's all. And yeah, I, I only want to share it on Twitter too, not Facebook. Right? Of course not. Uh, not until iOS Facebook. six then comes I'm around and Facebook yeah. is in integrated. Then you'll want to share it on Facebook. Then I can't wait to share on Facebook. <laughs> but I think also an, another side of this is obviously your subscriptions will be synced across your devices, which is kind of nice. So if you, like you said, you know, going back to the whole listening and the on the way to work thing, and then when you get to work, you can pick up where you left off on the new iOS six and. Uh, you know the, the, how that's going to happen on your on your desktop as well. 
All right, let's bust some FUD, Iaz. Everybody's seen the headlines that say Orbitz charges Apple users more than Ma- Windows users. Is it true? No, it's not true at all. <laughs> now, Wall Street Journal ran that article, and it had a headline that a lot of people couldn't get past because there's a paywall. So uh, <laughs> as, as of right now, I checked it out again. The paywall seems to be missing from that, that particular— We couldn't make the article come up with the paywall. That's correct. Now, it seemed point. like earlier this morning that was the issue. You could have a paywall issue, but not right now as of this recording. And here's what's actually going on. Okay, when, when you search on a Mac, and this is something Orbitz is experimenting with, this is not happening to everyone, Mac users may see at the top of their results hotels that cost more. Now, it's not, necess- it's not that Orbitz is charging more money for the same hotel room that a Windows user would see. It's simply the results are, they're just shown differently. And because of that, people are freaking out and going, oh no, they're charging Mac users more. No, they're not. They're simply showing the results differently. And the CEO is very clear, and if you've ever used one of these sites, you know that you can sort this by price, by location, all kinds of different ways. So that way, you can get the best deals up front, even if you're a Mac user. But the thing is, there's a lot of research. Forrester Research found out that uh, users of tablets, a lot of obviously a lot of tablet users are iPad users at this point. They place bigger online orders. Uh, they also have uh, people who use iPhones outspend shoppers using Android devices. So there's a chance that's the case. And then again, think about how big the Mac population is. It's like it's not that large. So it's people just losing their minds because they didn't read the full story. And there is a debate to be had about, you know, people in the chat room are saying it's still unethical. I don't think it's unethical to say, okay, we can tell you're on a Mac. That's just part of your user string in your browser. That's that's not a a, a, a new violation of privacy. You could, I guess we could debate if it's a violation of privacy, but that's been going on since browsers were created. We can tell what, what computer you're on. Your computer self-identifies. And if they have... Uh, the the data that says Apple users tend to want to see these kinds of hotels, we're going to surface those. I think that's fine. From what I read, it's not even at the top of the list. They're just, there are uh, higher quality hotels, which tend to be more expensive hotels, listed a little higher in the lower results. Usually the top few are the same no matter what you're looking at. So I, I don't think it's such a bad thing. If Look, if, if people who tend to use Apples tend to pay more for hotel rooms because they want to buy the fancy schmancy hotels, then surface that. I, I think that's absolutely fine. They're not actually charging them more. Even that. I think would be an interesting debate. Remember Amazon's variable pricing, mm. where depending on who you were and what time you bought, they would give you a different price. Uh, th- there was a lot of outrage against, about that. But, you know, I, Rich, what do you think? Does this bother you? Issue there. Uh, it doesn't bother me at all. I think this is uh, this is a wave of the future, and this is what's going to happen more and more in the future. I mean, we've seen with Google results, when you search Google, what you find in your results is totally different half the time than what someone else next to you is searching and finding. So what's the difference between Google and Orbitz? And of course, the mainstream media decided that this was a story about how Mac users are paying more for hotel rooms or how they're getting charged more. That's not really the story here, like you said. This is a matter of Orbitz trying to tailor tastes to people so that they make that transaction. I mean, the, the margin on these hotel rooms for Orbitz is tiny enough. So they're trying to squeeze every last thing they can do out of the system to try to figure out how to make people make the purchase. And if that means, you know, someone that's using a Mac comes to the site and likes to stay at boutique hotels that are four or five stars, so be it. That's I want to see those results first. And you can always sort these results the way you want. I mean, that's the beauty of these sites. I think the story here is that a paywall caused a lot of people to misunderstand a story because they weren't able to go through and read the whole story without paying. And a lot of people said, well, I'm not going to pay, but I get the gist of it. Mac users pay, I get charged more. Well, no, they don't. (laughs) Uh, but they weren't able, without paying, to go through and read the rest of that story. And I think that's why I'm sure Mac users a paid time. for the paywall to get through because they yeah, buy exactly. more stuff. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. The uh, Mac users all saw it. They all read the story just the way it was. They they saw exactly what it said because they already pay for the Wall Street Journal. Apparently, <laughs> well, Mac users pay for everything. That's right. I'm paying to tell you this right now. I, I, I don't pay get for paid. Skype. Yeah. Uh, Louis C.K. is wanting to get you to pay less to come see him on tour. He's selling tickets directly to fans. Uh, he very carefully didn't name any names, but he, he's going around ticket providers like Ticketmaster, like Tickets.com, uh, and selling directly to fans $45 each no matter where in the country you see him, which includes sales tax. So that means he gets a different amount of money depending on what the tax is in that various region. And there are no added fees. 
No convenience fee, no hidden tax, no delivery fee, no surcharges. You pay 45 bucks. That's it. You get your ticket. The tour is October through February, and he's using an online ticket service called eTix. Now, the other thing that he's doing is in the terms for the ticket, it says that if they catch you selling the ticket for more than you paid for it, your ticket may be canceled. You'll get your money back, but they'll just kill the ticket, and you won't be able to use it anymore. He doesn't want scalpers out there selling tickets for more than $45. He says, look, I've tried to lower my prices before, and the scalpers go and just run the price right back up, and it ends up being more to see me because I was selling it for less. So uh, he's he's definitely trying something new, and he says he's probably not going to make as much money as he would if he went through a service like a Ticketmaster uh, or something. Um, the other benefit he's touting is that he's going to have an email list that's opt-in, not opt-out, and that the only thing you'll ever get if you opt-in is an email from him telling you when his next album or his next tour is. He won't he won't sell that list to anybody else. Uh, he, he obviously blazed a trail previously by selling his comedy album directly uh, or comedy video directly for five bucks. Rich, uh, is this brilliant, uh, brilliant or is he is he dumb for not charging more? No, I think he's smart because he he realizes that no matter how much he charges, he's not making the rest of that money. So if his ticket sells for a hundred dollars, you know, fifty of that is going to Ticketmaster and these fees and all these uh, various things. That these ticket places are insane. If you buy a ticket for fifteen dollars, it ends up being thirty five. There, when you print at home, it's two dollars and fifty cents to print your ticket out at home. How is that even possible? How do they even justify that fee? A print at home fee? Not to mention the that. price of ink, which is probably <laughs> yeah. like five dollars. <laughs> They should be reimbursing me for the HP ink that it costs to (laughs) fill up my printer after I print out that thick barcode that goes across the thing. Uh, No, I think this guy's a trailblazer. I think what he's doing is very smart, and it goes to show the future of celebrity. Uh, It's all about having your 1,000 true fans, in his case, you know, 100,000 true fans, whatever they are, and having them, more of that money, come directly to you and and bypassing the middleman. Uh, It's interesting that he used an established company like eTix. I've never heard of them until today. Um, you know, there's obviously places like Eventbrite out there that, that sell tickets as well. I don't know what the cut that eTix is taking. And also these, um, usually these arenas have deals with like Ticketmaster. Like you can't sell tickets at a place unless you go through Ticketmaster. So he's obviously not having his concerts or his uh, concerts, his, uh, his comedy shows. Yeah. Yeah, his performances at, at big name places because most of those have deals. And that's part of the things that most people don't realize is if you want to have a show at the Greek Theater, you have to go through Ticketmaster. If you want to have a show at the Staples Center, you have to go because they have these pretty lucrative uh, deals with these ticketing companies. So I think this is very smart. I think he's he's really playing to his fans and everything he does at this point is going to be emulated by other people. We saw Aziz Ansari do the same thing with, uh, you know, his $5 download that I purchased and... Um, you know, with the no DRMs and stuff. So I think it's smart. I really do. He is actually, uh, he says in his blog post that he's going to play smaller theaters and have more dates in places like New York because he can't play in those big arenas because they have these exclusive deals with the other ticket selling companies. Ayaz, what do you think of this? I, th- I think, I mean, it, it's a great thing what Louis C.K. is doing. You know, different venues, can, you can go and see him. But, I mean, it, he's in a really privileged position. Same thing with Aziz Ansari and, and Jim Gaffigan. Th- these guys are really well-known. They've done a lot of work in mainstream media to the point where we know who they are. And we're like, oh, we can go to your website and we can go get, get it directly. And unless, you know, really top-tier talent follows suit, I mean, people like Take a Master are going to probably like elbow people and say, hey, look, you better go to that arena. This is the way it's going to work because it's kind of, you know, a bullying game there. It's, 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 it's great to see this happen. It's just well enough people follow the lead because it's not like any comedian can go do this. This is Louis right. C.K. He's got a FX you know, show right now. He's been on HBO. He's got specials. He even said he makes enough money in, from doing comedy that he can afford to do this. And that kind of thing takes a bit of altruism to go, yeah, you know what? I don't need all the money. I don't need the – he even said the ticket services were more convenient than this. If you're willing to put up with this somewhat of a headache – then that's worth it. But it's, it's However, a- I, I would argue Jonathan Colton, Paul and Storm, MC Lars, these are musical acts, but they're all on the other end of the scale. They didn't have big backing. They didn't have big success, and they used ticket services like Eventbrite to allow them to book into places that, wouldn't, that they might not have been able to get otherwise. Uh, so it, it, it kind of can work from both ends. It's kind of the only in the middle where it, tend, it yeah. seems like it's a problem. I just hope it works. It gets more exposure for everybody. You get to see what you want to see, and you're not getting ripped off. That's, that's my it's, favorite thing, not getting ripped off. 
it's also another example of how these strongholds from these, you know, these established mainstream companies are being broken. I mean, there's so many things that are in place nowadays that the internet is just changing. The fact that anyone can print out a ticket at home and just use that barcode and it gets you into a place, I mean, that's pretty amazing. The fact that you don't, I mean, do you guys remember when, when we were younger, you had to go to a, um, what was it, a blockbuster video or someplace that had a ticket master. You'd stand in line for hours and you would get your ticket printed out there. And if you weren't like number three in line or whatever, uh, you weren't going to get a good seat. I mean, to, the fact that we have gone this far and now we have artists that are sitting there saying, hey, you know what? We really want to respect the fans. We want to change this because this system has gotten way out of control and we're going to try to bring it back down to earth here. And I think that's what he's trying to do, both with selling his video by himself and also um, selling these tickets. Now, obviously, like you said, uh, I as this guy can do it. He can afford to do it. Everyone knows or a lot of people know his name. So but the small artists can do the same thing. And that's the beauty of it is that they can play small theaters and they can make more of that money, um, you know, if they sell tickets and, and grow that fan base. So I think the technology is really the story here about the fact that we can do this and the fact that it's happening right now. Let's move on to the randomizer. Randomizer. Okay, the Mars rover landing, the Curiosity, is happening in August, August 5th, about 10.30 p.m. Pacific. I think it's expected to finally hit Atmo uh, and descend. NASA has created what I think may be the best thing they've ever created. It's from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory engineers talking about the challenges of getting Curiosity to land on the surface of Mars. Let's, let's just play it right from the... Uh, from the top of the atmosphere to the surface of Mars... Going from thirty. Oh, this is more the detail to zero in perfect sequence, exactly perfect choreography, doing. perfect timing, and the computer has to do it all by itself with no help. Well, yeah, let's play it from the beginning, Jason. It, uh, that's when that's when the like super dramatic right. music uh, was hitting. Is this a Michael Bay film? When people look at it, this film not yet rated. Uh, it looks crazy. That's a very natural thing. Six vehicle configuration, <laughs> 76 pyrotechnic is devices. Is the result of reasoned engineering thought, but it still looks crazy. The top of the atmosphere. And these are the engineers talking. The they, I think they made some great scripts for them. If you go ahead and, and click through uh, towards the ending, you, you start to see the. Uh, see where we're going to land. And we had straight the, they've got a great effects as NASA always does with their simulations. Right they've got dramatic photos, things going a thousand miles an hour. You think it was seven million dollars just to make the effects? You can't get those rocket engines too close. Just to think about, because just to storyboard them. Their <laughs> engines all the way to. The if you watch this video, you get super excited. I was watching the video. Into it. it looks like it looks like either it's going to be this awesome thriller. I want to watch this. This should be on TV or it should be in the theater. Or I would play this game. This trailer is really, it's really good. If NASA was making movies like this, trailers like this, maybe manned space would still be around. But they got some really interesting ideas. And then the way this thing actually works is just absurd. Yeah, because it has to be lowered to the ground by a sky crane after it has been uh, jettisoned off of the module that brought it there. It's, it, you can see them getting all excited. These guys are excited about what's going on. And this, this is all true. It may be look, you know, look a little over dramatic with their angles and everything, but this is exactly how they're going to lower the Curiosity rover, which is about the size of a Mini Cooper, uh, to the surface of Mars. I, I'm getting excited about and the, this. And the video thing. makes reference to the seven minutes of terror where there's no communications because it takes 14 minutes for the, for the, for the signals to get back to Earth. And for seven minutes, either this rover is dead or alive, and they have no idea at NASA at home. It's a $2.5 billion curiosity landed. Seven minutes of terror. Seven minutes of terror sounds like my drive home when I go through a dead spot with the cell phone tower so my wife can't get a hold of me, you know? You're comparing your drive home to landing on Mars. <laughs> you know, here's That's the LA. thing about this video. It, it's, yeah, LA the drive home is in LA is, it is pretty hellacious. Um, yeah, and if you survive it, it's pretty amazing. But uh, this this gets people excited about science. It gets people excited about engineering, and I think that's what they went for here. It seems like they have a new guy there. Like You've got some like USC film student that's now working at JPL, and he's like, you know what? I'm going to make this cool again. I'm going to make this awesome video. And you know the people at JPL and NASA were just like, wow, this is really good. This, this is really exciting. Um, and so I think this is really neat that they've done this, and the way they describe it and, and the video is is pretty neat. So... A thousand miles per hour descent and a parachute yeah. deploys to slow it. Uh, wow, crazy! Stuff. That's made of some crazy Kevlar. And uh, I, 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 I can't wait to watch at, on the edge of my seat and see this thing happen. Let's check the calendar, shall we? 
Let's check the Jonathan Strickland Memorial Calendar. Happy birthday, Jonathan Strickland. Today, extended cut for Mass Effect 3 hits. And remember, if it stinks, complain some more. Maybe you'll get another free add-on. Sony's PlayStation 3 gets more firm. Where today? Go to PS3 for, uh, get PS3 firmware 4.2 today in case you like doing things like accessing online content. Megapixel heads, listen up. Today, you can pre-order the Nokia 808 PureView 41 megapixel camera. 41 megapixel from Amazon UK for the low, low price of about 500 British pounds. The camera ships on June 30th. Hey, that's my boy's birthday. Tomorrow, June 27th, Google I.O. starts and runs through the 29th. We'll have breaking news coverage here at twitlive.twit.tv starting at 9.30 a.m. Pacific. Tomorrow will also be exciting for Microsoft as an EU court will rule on whether Microsoft must pay $1.1 billion in a fine related to antitrust allegations. All right, let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. We have a voicemail to 260-TNT-SHOW with a question about the Microsoft Surface and watching TV on it. Hey, guys, this is Phil. Uh, I have a question that nobody seems to be asking. Will I need to pay money to watch Hulu on the Microsoft Surface? Because when you think about it, Hulu and most video providers charge fees to access content on touch screens or lean back screens. If Surface Pro runs full Windows 98, rather, Windows 8, uh, how could this continue? And how will they explain it to the Windows RT uh, machines that um, don't run full Windows 8 if they make the same? Yes, okay, Phil. We, we get it. Good. Good question. Uh, yeah. Windows 8 Pro on the Surface Pro. Is that blockable? Are we going to see oh. Hulu blocking? If they block that, it is war. On Windows RT, I think it's easy to explain. Like, oh, we don't run Flash. We don't run yeah. Flash on the Windows RT Internet Explorer. Mm -hmm. uh, or if we yeah, do, we it's a, that. minimal. Yeah. That, that's an easier sell. But Windows Surface with Windows 8 should, should play Hulu. I don't think there's any way they could justify it not playing Hulu. I mean, you're, you're running a full version of Windows on a device. Yes, it's a tablet. It also has a keyboard. So, I mean, there's just no way. I mean, the tech community would have to get up in arms. I mean, it was bad enough they blocked it on Chrome on Google TV uh, the first day it came out. So, And all the other networks followed suit. But if they block this on a tablet where you're running a full version... It, they shouldn't be blocking on anything. It, it should be, you know, I get it for Hulu Plus if you're getting that premium content, but the basic content that you should be able to access on any browser should be there. I wonder if Hulu Plus is just going to be an app in the App Store, I mean, in Windows, in Windows Market, so that you can get it on both and you don't even realize that you can go to the desktop app and then go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a tricky situation for Microsoft and the video providers who back Hulu, the networks, uh, because they'll want to block it. Because they, they don't want any precedent that tablets can get Hulu uh, to exist. So far, they've fought them all off. We'll then see what the definition of what is a PC will continue and yeah. rage on. Uh, thanks to everybody who submitted stories on our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. That is the place to let us know what stories you'd like us to hear or talk about, what stories you'd like to hear about on the show. Rich DeMiro, thank you for joining us. Uh, of course, uh, you can catch Rich on KTLA in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, you've got a website as well. Uh, any anything in particular you want to plug? Uh, my Twitter, twitter.com slash Rich DeMiro. My Facebook, facebook.com slash Rich on Tech. That's where I am usually sharing uh, Instagrams of whatever I eat. Excellent. All right. <laughs> I, now I'm going to be hungry following you. Uh, well, that's it for this episode of Tech News Today. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv. Or give us a call, leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. Shannon Morse from Hacks 5. Hacks 5. Hacks 5 joins us tomorrow. We'll see you then. Yeah.